Good evening and welcome everyone to our monthly author series here at our Corrales Community Library. I'd like to thank our focal group for sponsoring our Zoom Pro platform tonight. Now, earlier in the week, I received an email that said, Stacia is a local treasure. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly agree. Stacia Spragbrod is an award-winning photojournalist and writer who lives here in Corrales with her family. And for many years, Stacia worked for the Albuquerque Tribune and explored our beautiful state. And currently she's working on projects that explore our connection to the land. Please join me in welcoming Stacia as she presents To Walk in Beauty, a Navajo Family's Journey Home, and If There are Squash Bugs in Heaven, I Ain't Staying, Learning to Make the Perfect Pie, Sing When You Need to, and Find the Way Home with Farmer Evelyn. Welcome, Stacia. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. I, I um, thank you so much for having um, me tonight and to all of the staff at the Corrales Library. We have got an amazing library here. Um, it really is like entering your, um, for all those folks who don't live here, it's like entering your Uncle Bob and Aunt Dot's house. I mean, you come in the doors and there's the little fish pond and all the books on the shelves. There's kids running around and happy volunteers and somehow you guys um, are able to like get through these COVID times and we check out books. It's like, um, it reminds me of when we had weekly readers back at school and you'd check out the books you wanted to, to write and suddenly this big bag of books would arrive. So we can do it at the Corrales Library right now, even though we can't go in, you, you type in the book you want and they put them in a little paper bag outside on, um, on the shelf and Oh my gosh, we need you. So thank you, Sandra, for having us and um, our Corrales Library. It is just one of the, um, the many things that I love about Corrales. And um, I'm, I'm not from here. I came here about 25 years ago. I'm from Indiana. Um, I grew up there, spent a lot of time on my grandmother's front porch and, um, and dreamed of you know seeing the world and setting out. Um, but I eventually, I, I uh, worked many places around the world, mostly in the Balkans, back with Lisa, who's on here, back in the Balkans in the 90s, the crazy Balkans. And I came here back about 25 years ago to uh, take a staff job at the Albuquerque Tribune, which has since um, closed its doors, unfortunately, but was seriously a kick-ass paper. Um, and one of my first assignments was actually to Corrales. Um, I was given the job, can you believe this? The Bosque was being closed for fire danger, right? <laughs> Anybody who lives here knows how often the Bosque gets closed. So I got this assignment as the intern to go make a picture of the Bosque being closed for fire danger. And I came out here, it was only supposed to be like a half an hour assignment. And um, so I showed up and the, the, the Corrales Fire Department, they, I think they were all volunteer at the time. I'm not sure if there was any like full-time, it was all volunteer. Anyway, I show up and these, these firemen are like, okay, you can go with us. You know, let's just go patrol the Bosque and we're gonna close it down and have people, um, you know, have to leave the Bosque because of the fire. And they're like, I'm like, okay, I've got my cameras, let's go. I'm like, well, where's your horse? I'm like, well, um, I, I don't have a horse. Um, and they're like, okay, well, just come along. So I hop in the, like the fire truck and away we go um, to one of the friends of the firefighters who had a, a horse that I could borrow. And <laughs> so we get on the horse. I spend the entire day riding with these um, firemen like through the Bosque, like working. Um, and, uh, you know, up and down the river, we had snacks and everything. I don't think I got back to the newsroom until like after seven that night. Um, and I thought, oh my God, this, this is my place. This is my kind of place. And, um, and so here I am, I haven't left. Um, so yeah, that's my Corrales story, how we, we end up in this village. Um, I, I brought along a couple, I didn't bring along, I'm just here. I have a couple of bodies of work to share with you because I've spent the last, oh my gosh, quarter century already um, having the benefit of existing with a, a few different people are really special to me. And that is the Begay family of the Navajo reservation and our own beloved Evelyn Curtis Losack here of Corrales. And I have um, 
throughout my life as a photojournalist and now as a writer have been really God captured by this whole idea of what, you know, what is home? What does it mean to be home? What does it mean to find home? And maybe many of you don't live where you grew up, but it's, you know, I, I grew up always wanting to see the world. And then I grew up always wanting to find home. And for me, um, Evelyn and the Begay family have taught me what it means to to find home and it's it's a little beyond just finding your roots. And so that's the work that I'd like to share with you tonight because um, they have taught me a lot. And I, I, I think their stories, um, you know, are pretty universal. And I, you know, I've shared this work with a lot of people in the last uh, several years. And I find that, you know, you don't have to be Navajo. You don't have to be a farmer to identify with them. And, and that's why I've just, fallen in love with them and, and I have this passion for these projects. Um, so I, I thought what I could do is I'd, I'd talk a little bit first about the, the Navajo project and I'm not used to zo doing Zoom. Um, so I have a slideshow and it's probably about 12 or 13 minutes long with some music that I'd show you after I talk a little bit about it. And then we can move into the Evelyn project. And I think we go until about eight so we can you know open it up for for, uh, questions and discussions or anything at the end. Um, so when I moved here, I was um, I was interning at the Albuquerque Tribune and I came across uh, this press release at the paper for something called the Sheep is Life Festival. And I, I didn't grow up with animals. I didn't grow up on a farm, even though I would have loved to. And um, I, I was just kind of intrigued by this whole idea of sheep is life. I mean, what the hell does that mean? It's not even... I don't even know if it's grammatically correct, but I, I was taken by it. And um, so one weekend I drove out to meet the family who was involved with this, the Begays, and they live out in, um, in Jetito. The, the Navajo reservation extends um, in New Mexico and into Arizona and up into Utah. So this was out in Arizona. And I drove out one Sunday morning, of course, you know, growing up in the Midwest, you're on time by God. So I was there 8 a.m., you know, Sunday morning, knocking on the door, nobody answers. And finally, this little girl, she's like three years old, opens the door. I'm like, hi, I'm Stacia from the Tribune. I'm here to do a story on the Sheep is Life Festival. And she's like, uh, yeah. And I, I hear um, her parents, you know, upstairs. And they're like, oh, come on in. You know, make yourself a home. We're not awake yet, but um, there's coffee in the kitchen. Go ahead and make some coffee. And, you know, I said, come in, <laughs> make some coffee. We, we immediately bonded and I, I just had this feeling, I'm sure all of you had this feeling at some point in, in your lives um, where you're like, I'm, I'm meant to be here. There's something that has, has brought me here. And, and that's how I felt with the Begays. Um, what fascinated me was at the time, you know, there's several siblings and I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, Sharon and Alta, uh, two of the girls in the family. Here they were, I guess at the time they were probably in their thirties and they were working full time. They had a mess of kids. They had all these things. And, and during the free time, they were like trying to save a sheep that was nearly endangered, um, but considered sacred to the Navajo. And somehow they made this their, their passion and, and, and something that they just had to do. And that just really captivated them. Like, why would why would somebody do this? Why would you attach so strongly to a sheep? Um, there's a whole story in this, right? And a lot of it is in the book I did um, uh, several years ago, the Museum of New Mexico published the book on, on the Begay family. And so you'll have to read the book if you want the whole story, but um, to, to kind of, you know, uh, briefly talk about it. So, the Navajos have lived here, right, you know, for hundreds of years. And when the Spanish moved in back in the 15 and 1600s, they brought with them what were called the churro sheep. And they're kind of these scraggly sheep with this long fur. They're not like the, um, the fat cartoon sheep, right, with the great fleece. They're just this long scraggly sheep. And some of you probably know um, Pat Clouser here, our, our um, former village counselor. Um, who's raised churro sheep. So some of you have probably seen her churro sheep. Um, and 
so the Navajos took to them instantly. They raised them for mutton. They raised them to, um, you know, for their fleece and for warmth and for clothing. This went on for hundreds of years. And as you know, as we all know, as we can imagine, there was a lot of warfare that went on among the, the native tribes here and the Spanish um, conquistadors and the settlers who came in. And then in the 19th century, you know, the Americans started moving in. There's lots of battles, centuries of battles, lots of raids to get, you know, sheep and, and horses. This culminated back in the 1860s. And this is like a little known history um, to, for a lot of us. The, the Navajos were actually um, forcibly removed from their homeland and they were marched hundreds of miles across New Mexico to Bosque Redondo. And they were in prison there for like three years. This was back in the 1860s um, at the culmination of all these warfare among everybody. And when that happened, um, a lot of the Churro sheep were killed off. Now to take a step back, the, the, the Navajo, for the Navajos, they weren't just sheep. They, the Navajos considered this like gifts from their holy people. They saw these as like these sacred creatures and they considered them you know, part of their family. It wasn't just, um, livestock. And so they, they were away from home for three years. When they were allowed to return, they were given some sheep, but the, a lot of those numbers had, had declined. And a lot of other sheep were introduced because um, uh, people wanted to have Navajo weavings and, um, and rugs and things. So a different types of sheep were introduced. But the hero numbers were starting to decline. And this continued um, up into the 1930s, this was the this was a horrible um, time for the Navajo people. This was during the Dust Bowl time, and throughout um, the western part of the country, there was a lot of overgrazing. And in order to um, to prevent that and to slow that, the uh, a lot of the livestock was killed. So, out on the Navajo reservation. Uh, authorities came in, U.S. authorities came in, and they actually slaughtered a lot of the sheep. And the first targeted were the churro sheep because they looked scraggly. They didn't look as well, even though they were really well adapted to a desert environment. And if you meet a lot of elders today, a lot of Navajo elders, they'd, I guess, be in their 80s and 90s by now. And in fact, members of um, the Big A family I'm friends with, they witnessed this. They'd, they'd come in, um, the U.S. authorities would come in and they would actually kill the sheep in, in front of the family. And uh, one of the family stories in the Begay family was the authorities came in and they didn't explain that what they were doing or why. You know, there's a lot of lost in translation. And the grandmother actually was trying to like hold back. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the forces, while she watched them kill her family's sheep, and they were left there. And it, it was just a, a huge, um, you can imagine what this did for the, the, the Navajo people, not just on that spiritual level, but on a practical level because the, the sheep were, um, it was a subsistence culture and they, they used their sheep for um, food and shelter. And, you know, so after the Dust Bowl, when the flocks had really been decimated, you had a lot of Navajos leaving the, you know, the reservation to get wage jobs. Um, a lot of Navajos served in World War II and they'd leave the reservation. So the family starts breaking down. The, sh the numbers of the sheep start breaking down. Then in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of those kids were sent to, uh, uh, the Navajo children were sent to boarding schools. So, and the Begay family, um, Sharon and her sister were, um, were sent off to school. And, um, for, for the Navajo, I mean, being away from the family, the ceremonies last for, for days, right? And uh, so those kids didn't participate in any of the ceremonies. They didn't learn any of their language or have that kind of interaction with their, their grandparents. Um, you know, this reminds me, I'm gonna do this little reading from, from the book because to me, this really illustrates that this connection um, between the generations. And, and this was what was being lost uh, when the kids were removed to, removed to boarding school. So this is from, oh my glasses. This is from, uh, from Sharon. She's talking about her grandfather. 
with my grandpa, him being a medicine man, we would herd sheep and he would tie me to him on the horse. And when I was out there, sometimes I would get really sleepy. And I remember my head knocking into his back as he was riding along and he'd be singing. I could hear him. I would have my ear to his back and he'd be singing away. And that's how I would take my naps a lot of the times. There's one song that says, I'm the granddaughter of mother earth. When he passed away, I could never finish that song. They sing that song during the blessing way or when they have the coming of age ceremony. I was so close to him when he was really sick and he called me, he told my grandma, he said, tell my granddaughter to come. She's the only one that can do the ceremony for me. I guess he was trying to say goodbye to me. Everyone else around me said, how come my grandpa's asking for her? What about asking for the rest of us? They were saying, and then he told me, put a cloth on the ground. He told me to take out his arrowheads and make a circle around him. And I did that. He said, I'm going to teach you the song. It's the going away song. He sang that song while I was there. And then he went off to the hospital. That morning, I just took the sheep out. I was herding down by the canyon. About 10 o'clock, I felt this wind come. It was like a light, a candlelight. And that's how I think of it, a candlelight being blown out. And I knew then that my grandfather had passed away. Um, so this was, the boarding schools were really devastating. And you know, Sharon, who, who was talking about the story about her grandfather recalls in boarding school, before she left, her grandfather said, don't let them cut your hair because that is your knowledge. And that's the first thing they did in, in, in boarding school was to cut the kid's hair. And then he also said, don't lose your language. Don't ever stop speaking Navajo or you will, you'll stop being Navajo. And, um, and they made them stop speaking Navajo. And so she was always in trouble. She never got to do anything because she was always in trouble at boarding school. So when they came back by the 1970s, you can imagine um, how the family was at that point. Goldtooth and Mary Begay, who were the elders in the family, were drinking a lot. Um, the kids weren't coming around, the sheep were gone. And the girls left the reservation to study at university and their mission was to come back and try to help their people. And through um, what can only be described as a beautiful story, they, um, they had this chance encounter with uh, a sheep researcher who was who had come across this churro sheep that by now was almost in danger. There was just a couple hundred left. And when Goldtooth met him, he said to his daughters, you need to bring these sheep back to our people. This is what's going to save us. And they did. They, um, they would gather these sheep from the, the researcher up in Utah. And one story, um, Alta would describe they had the um, churro rams in the back of their truck and they had stopped at this gas station right across the border in New Mexico. They'd fallen asleep and they wake up and this um, old Navajo man is walking around the trailer and he's crying. And they're like, um, you know, grandfather, why are you crying? And he's like, I thought these sheep had gone forever. And they're like, no grandpa, we're bringing them back. <laughs> and um, so, this is what the family did. The, the girls came back to the reservation. They started um, building up this nucleus flock of churro feet, sheep. They got their kids involved. So all the little kids that I photographed in this book, they all got their little lambs and they all had little different ear tags, the different colors for you know which ones they belonged to. And the kids started spending time with Goldtooth and Mary who stopped drinking. They would describe hearing the sheep bells in the morning and they, they would say to me, our, when the sheep came back, our song came back. And uh, the grandkids started spending time, the, the family was starting to come back together again. And this is when I met them. And I was so taken um, by the story. I would spend my weekends, you know, just spending time with them, mostly like trying to herd sheep, but often I would like herd sheep and the sheep would end up somewhere other than where they were supposed to. Anyway, it was fun. Um, 
And for a time I, I lived um, in the Hogan on the reservation and, and Sharon actually lived, I, I rented the little house next to um, Marcos Gutierrez, you know, the veterinarian at that little adobe house. So Sharon lived there for a while and brought gold tooth out. And I lived on the reservation and um, anyway, it was a great time. And I thought I was photographing um, the, you know, this family saving the sheep, but it, it became clear very quickly that it was more of a story about the sheep saving the family and, um, and bringing back this family and, and, and getting through a lot of this and, and ultimately finding home. It was, um, it was Sharon and her family saying, who were our ancestors and who are we? And what does this all mean? And this sheep and body, what it means. And they knew it, Raising sheep is hard. Raising any kind of animal is hard, but trying to make a living off of raising sheep, you know, they knew that this would be a hard thing. But you know, like, even if our kids just raise one or two of these Navajo Navajo sheep, they'll um, they'll hold on to what it means to be Navajo. So this is what I tried to capture um, in the pictures, and I and I have a few here. Um, I have a slideshow here, and. So what I could do is I've, I've got about um, 12 or 13 minutes of a slideshow and it has some music with it. So I think I can share the screen and, um, and share some of these pictures with you. And after that, then we'll move into Evelyn because who couldn't use a day with Evelyn right now in her kitchen sipping some cider, right? We'll move to that. So let me, um, let me share our screen. And, um, and show these pictures. Let's see here. Okay, hold on here. Is it screen sharing? Can you guys see me, Sandra? Do you see that? It's working fine. We can see you. Hold on here. Or see your screen. <laughs> Let's see, view full screen. Okay, now I'm gonna hit play. And this should you should you guys should hear the sound. This is um some Navajo um, music from the Native American Church. It's Navajo community music. So um, here we go. <laughs> What do you know? I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. What do you know? I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. What do you know? I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain. The sun is cold. I just can't be a long pain.
That was beautiful. As you advance through your slideshow, each one, each picture captured so much. Um, just beautiful. It was, um, you know, the, this time of year reminds me a lot of being on um, on the reservation, the, the, the all night ceremonies. There were, it was always winter, it's always cold. And, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd go in, the men would gather the pinon and the cedar all day. They'd build this big fire outside and you'd go in the ceremony, the medicine man would sing all night and you wouldn't understand a word he'd say, you know, just like that music. Mm -hmm. And it was just this, this prayer and, and before dawn, he'd go outside, every star and, and the universe would be out there and you'd feel better, even though you didn't even understand the prayer or the song, and then it would become snow and then it would become dawn. And this was this time with his family. And this is what this, um, this is what meant to me. It, it it may not make a whole lot of sense to transition from this part of the world to Evelyn, but anybody who knew Evelyn Curtis Losak um, would get it because it it's about it, it's about the bigger picture. It's about and there's so much talk right now, especially in COVID times, of being in the moment and living in the moment, and. For me, um, the Begay family and Evelyn and the pictures I'll share with you, it's more about living in the moment. It's about connecting to who came before you and, and how you came to be here and, and, and what this man, this land, you know, means to you and what you're going to give back. And, and that's why, um, you know, the Big A family just worked so hard to try to save this type of sheep. It wasn't about just the sheep. It was about what it meant to be Navajo, what it meant to be where you are. And it's not so much about, um, you know, owning land. It was about belonging to land and about allowing yourself to belong to a place. And anybody who knew Evelyn knows that. And, um, oh. I think of, you know, the, today, you know, with this, this beautiful snowstorm that we had last night, how much Evelyn would have loved this, okay? All this rain, all this water. And if this would have been a day that Evelyn was alive and you would have been in Evelyn's kitchen, okay, you know what would be on the stove right now? It'd be this big pot of simmering end of season tomatoes, like those gorgeous Cherokees and, you know, beef steaks and all the end of season tomatoes that have just absorbed all of the Corrales summer and fall. And she'd have them on that stove right now and you know it. And she would serve you a really big cold glass of apple cider with, with wine saps and, and Yorks. She'd throw in some pears too. And you'd have that cider and you'd be sitting in her kitchen right now and you'd have this snow and she, you'd smell this tomato and you'd smell that basil. She always had fields and rows of basil. And anytime I smell basil now, I'm in that field again. And she'd have that going, but you wouldn't just be sitting there. She'd have you ladling jars of the end of the apples and the pears and everything else that she had harvested. And, and you'd be ladling it in to make these jams, these jars of jams, you know, and she'd have some opera going. 
This was Evelyn, right? You'd be sitting in her kitchen. You know what? She'd say with this pandemic, she's like, oh, the hell with the pandemic. You know, Evelyn was born in 1929. She was born in the Depression. And she lived through all this. She lived through drought, okay? Um, and we'll get through this. And that's what she'd say. Honey, we'll get through this. And you know, that's what she'd say. And, and that was Evelyn's kitchen. Her door was unlocked. Her door was unlocked. Literally and figuratively, you'd go in and you'd sit in Evelyn's kitchen and it would all be all right. You'd laugh, you'd cry, you'd be put to work, right? You'd be ladling jam, you'd be doing something. Oh my gosh, I digress. Let, let's talk about Evelyn. Let's talk about Evelyn. Here is Evelyn in her field. Um, you see if I can uh, flip through these pictures. Okay, hold on here. Full screen, my tech support. It's having me hit. Okay, here we go. Here are Evelyn's grandparents. This is what started it. Angelo and Maria Salce from Italy. This was back in the 1870s. Angelo came here. He started the farm here in Corrales. And they grew alfalfa and fruit and vegetables. He would go out, if you can believe it, look at him. Isn't he awesome, right? He would go out in the field and he would sing um, arias from Traviata, right? Can't you see it? Can't you see where Evelyn gets that? This is one of their daughters, um, Dosalino, which I'm sure many of you who are in tune um, hopefully had the privilege of meeting. This is with um, Roberta Allery. They're on top of a haystack. Aren't they best friends? Isn't that beautiful? This is all Corrales back in the day. The, um, the family grew chili and apples. This is when people bought apples by the bushel and they'd come out to Corrales and buy this. And, and this was the farm stand back in the day. This is Evelyn's farm. Dosalina married Vincent Curtis. And here's Evelyn and her sister Dorothy, who still lives on the family farm. And, um, and they, they, you know, continue to farm. And actually, um, many of you probably uh, have seen a lot of the old fruit trees. So back in the day, Corrales grew a lot of, um, man, they grew the hooch back in the prohibition. And, you know, you need to read Mary Davis's books, the history books here in Corrales. I have some of this in my books, but you need to see Mary Davis's books too. Um, and so after prohibition, back in the 40s and 50s, a lot of Corrales families uh, planted these wonderful fruit orchards. And this is what we have today. This is our legacy, right? And this is what um, Evelyn's family did. Oh my gosh, look at this. Evelyn and Dorothy, weren't they just like a piece of work? I just love this picture. Here's Evelyn with her Coca-Cola. Man, does she kick ass or what? I just love it. So this is how she, she grew up on the farm. And, um, you know, okay, here, here it is. Here's the picture. Evelyn on her farm hall, right? And here is Evelyn just a few years ago. She was, I hope everybody in this program got a chance to meet her, but those of you who don't, she was the village of Corrales' matriarch. Uh, you know, uh, let's just say it, she was. What she did not start in this village, she helped start. Um, our Harvest Festival, she and her husband, Johnny Losak, started the Harvest Fest. They hitched up a wagon on the back of um, a tractor and they rode through their orchard and had kids jump off and pick apples. And that was our Harvest Fest. She started the Corrales Growers Market, the music festivals here, the old church. I mean, the old church was being used for everything you can imagine, storage and the theater and God knows what else. And it was Evelyn and other people who got together and were like, let's save this. Let's save our old church. Let's, um, you know, there's people buried underneath the floors in the church. It's people like Evelyn who saved it. She would, oh my gosh, if you had an elm tree in your yard, good golly. Um, <laughs> the, the elm trees here, they're beautiful. I grant you, they give shade, but they suck up water. And Evelyn was all about how do we save water? She would, she would tell me, 
you know, Stacia, I had a dream last night that the aquifer beneath us was just shrinking. And this is the aquifer, this is like the underground sea under cross that gives us our water. And she would be worried. Like that was her cause of insomnia, like worried that there's enough water for the next generation. And um, she would write letters to the editor at the Corrales comment, like, you know, we've got to chop down these elms. We got to do something about this. She was, she was committed to her village and to her community and, and making it and not just living in it, but making it and honoring our ancestors. Here's Evelyn and Johnny. Aren't they cute? Oh, they're apples. Here's Johnny later in life pressing apple cider. Oh my gosh. So I met Evelyn several years ago, but when we connected on this project, I, did, I ended up doing this book on her. Um, we were serving on a farmland um, agricultural committee, which is now commission. I'm still on it. And Evelyn was on the committee. You know, of course she was. And she whispers to me during one of, the, one of these meetings, she's like, honey, I don't think I can plant this year. I'm getting too old. My family's going to get mad. I'm going to you know, trip in the, you know, the, the dirt. I can't do it. I'm like, okay, Evelyn, I'll come help you. This was after the, after the, the Navajo book. I'm like, I'll come help you. Let's, let's plant. And so here's a picture, um, uh, a fellow friend here, Jen with the hat and John Eve's daughter, John Eve, right in the back. And so I helped her, I started helping her on the farm and like the second day, you know, I was just intent on, I was just happy growing potatoes and smelling that basil and eating those tomato sauces she would make. I'm like, oh no, 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 this is a book. This is, Evelyn is just, this is a person who's connected to the land, who's, um, who gets it. And um, so I started the project. And so, you know, the farm, there's a, there's a magic there. There's a magic. If you've ever had the chance to be on a farm or in a place where things are grown, um, it comes alive and it takes you. And suddenly the seasons have meaning and depth and connection. That just, um, it, it, it spoke something, you know, to my soul, like connecting to land and this is home, you know, and picking apples and smelling earth and having mud on your feet and feeling the rain. It's not just rain, but you, you feel it. Um, she made um, the, uh, the fruit fruit roll-ups, I'm blanking on the name. She made the fruit roll-ups the old fashioned way. Of course, now you have like dehydrators or you can put them in the oven. Well, she would insist on, you know, putting them out in the sun and then not just putting them out in the sun, but you had to like go out and move the tables so they'd follow the sun so that the fruit would dry, right? This was inside of her barn. And okay, I bet a lot of you will remember this, but if you ever bought anything from Evelyn's barn, if you couldn't make it to the, the grower's market, you went to her barn and you went inside and you could buy some cider and you could buy some dried basil and oregano and sunflowers and jam and vinegar. And she made her own vinegar. Who does that? Who makes their own vinegar? She'd have that. And you know how you paid? You stuff some money in a little box and she trusted you. And you leave the barn and you slam the barn door and that was it. That was how you got it. She loved her flowers. And she covered her blackberries. And Evelyn's farm was not Pinterest, <laughs> okay? Um, so this is the barn in the back. And as my grandma would say, as Jack built. And then the canisters you see in the background, those are smokers that they would use to, um, to keep the fruit trees from losing their blossoms, you know, when it would get cold. And see the little plastic? She would save those damn milk jugs and 
when she would transplant her little tomatoes, she'd put them under there. She's like, oh, honey, it's shade for the tomatoes. They want a little shade. So we'd have to go out there and like line plastic bottles over all the tomato plants. This is her mean goose. <laughs> I bet some of you guys were chased by her little mean goose at some point. Oh my gosh. So even if you didn't meet Evelyn, maybe you were lucky enough to have some of Evelyn's pie at the grower's market. And so as a photographer, I'm like, okay, I want to come and photograph you making the pie. And she's like, okay, honey, we'll come Sunday morning before, you know, before the grower's market. I'm like, okay, what time? I'm thinking like, you know, six or seven. So like come around three and I'm like, oh, three in the morning. Okay. Um, so I get there. And of course she has some lovely you know Italian opera playing in in the kitchen and she's rolling out the dough and Evelyn's pies she never just used one fruit no she used everything she had the plums the pears you know whatever she had she put in the fruit she never wasted anything it went into her pie and that pie I had to tell you was magic <sighs> as was her farm. Everybody needs a place like that. And when she couldn't walk, <laughs> she crawled through her rows and froze with her little Goldie, her dear Goldie. So one thing Evelyn did that that took me back, she would um, she would take care of her ancestors' graves. Okay, so how many of us still do that? How many of us still can can still do that? Can still live in the place where we can do that? We would go and okay, so she'd take all those plastic bottles, the Gatorade bottles, and all those stupid plastic things. She'd collect them. She wouldn't throw anything away, and she'd fill them all with water. Actually, I would fill them all with water and put them in the back of the truck, and we'd drive to the um, the Corrales Cemetery. And if you ever visited the Corrales Cemetery <laughs> um, for several years here, you would find like these mysterious half-filled bottles of plastic water behind certain tombstones. Well, that was Evelyn and she would fill these bottles and bring them out to water the little plants and things on her ancestors' graves. And then on, on Christmas Eve, she would make uh, the, the new Mexican tradition of faralitos. So you would fill all these little carefully um, wrapped um, paper bags with sand and candles and fill the trunk of John Eve's car and drive slowly through the cemetery and take all of these little farolitos and put them around all the graves of all her ancestors. And that took me back when I was a little girl, I hadn't thought of this. And my grandmother, um, the same age, she would gather all the baby's breath and her roses, her prized roses, and she would cut them on Memorial Day. And she'd load up the little mints and candies and things in the car and we drive to the south part of Indianapolis where I grew up and we'd carry all of these flowers and we'd put them around and my job was to fill each of the little canisters with water to put the little flowers in each one and I didn't realize that at the time that that's just something you did that just went unnoticed I mean who's going to notice this but the dead right who, who goes out to do this? But Evelyn did. And it connected me immediately with what it meant to root yourself in a time and place. Um, and, and that's what she did. Um, <laughs> look at her glove here in this picture. <laughs> that's what I love. Okay, this is, um, this is pre-COVID times. So nobody wore gloves. In fact, Evelyn would always yell at me for not wearing a glove when I was out farming with her. But she had these strange like surgical gloves and you can see where it's got a big rip in it, but by God, she was gonna use it until it disintegrated to pieces. And um, <laughs> that's just how she was. 
this is okay. So the title of the book, if there's squash bugs in heaven, I ain't staying. So one day I drove up, if you've ever tried to grow winter squash in Corrales, you will know about the little squash bug. Um, this little gray, horrible beast that, um, will kill your squash plant overnight. And the one time I drove up, Evelyn was borrowing this like motorized scooter from a neighbor and she's like hauling ass across the field. I'm like, Evelyn. And she's got this big squash plant in her hand. It's got like the big yellow flowers, the big leaves. It's even got like a little couple squashes on it. She's driving across the farm. She's headed to the, the pond. She gets up, she stands up and she hurls the squash plant into the pond and she's like, out you damn bastards, there you go. <laughs> um, she hated squash bugs, nothing could get rid of them. And um, so if you happen to have the book or if you get one from the library or the Frontier Mart or any of the other seller, booksellers, if you um, take off the front flap, you'll see, <laughs> it's my little joke. There's little squash bugs that are going across the, the book. Um, oh my God, Evelyn was so mad when I did that. But yeah, that was it. The other thing, I don't know how much time we're, we're let me check my time here. Oh my God, it's 7.58. You're fine. We're, I'm, we're really enjoying this station. Are you? Yes. Oh, okay, because I, you know, I can't see anybody's faces. I can't see people yawning, but I would really <laughs> love to read this one thing because this is one thing I got to say that Evelyn had and the Begays had, and that was going to the trouble, going the extra mile when you just wanna come home and turn on Netflix and turn off the rest of the world. And people like Evelyn and people like the Begays, they go to the trouble of, of, of doing something beyond them, beyond the present moment to something gone. Evelyn was a music teacher beyond all the farming for over 60 years, God knows thousands of kids, in fact, this is why she called everybody honey because she had so many music kids, she couldn't remember their names. So she took to just calling everybody honey. <laughs> um, so one day during the summer, I've got this little reading here. Let me see, I should flip a picture here. Here we are, look at a new picture. All week long, Evelyn and John Eve have been teaching music camp to a smattering of children gathered at the farmhouse. The living room floor is an obstacle course of tambourines and triangles, xylophones, drums, number two pencils. Evelyn starts them singing, it's a small world. She calls out directions over their voices. When you sing, honeys, you always have to raise your eyebrows so you have puffiness. The kids all puff out their cheeks and stomachs and belt the words out louder and louder. It's a small world after all, exploding into erratic notes and laughter. Evelyn is undaunted. They'll get it. They already know what music is way deep down, the rhythms and melodies there long before they learned to speak, before they lined up at rows in school and were told the rules. The children splay out across the floor on their backs and tummies like popsicle sticks, all red and orange and sweet. Evelyn puts on a recording of Saint-Saëns' Carnival of the Animals. She tells them to close their eyes and try to hear the animals. Just listen, children. The children giggle and squirm, and then they grow quiet as the notes fill the room, and they remember what they already knew. The music gets louder, and they start to smile as they see a whole carnival of animals coming to life, right in the middle of Miss Evelyn's living room. Wild donkeys and plucky cockerels, graceful tortoises, nosing around the harp, kangaroos pouncing across the keyboard. The oboe is now an elephant and the swan floats by on a dream. Evelyn brings them back as the music ends and they open their eyes. So honeys, have you learned to listen to music now? The song of the swan is one of the most beautiful melodies you will ever know in life. And honeys, I want you to remember it. One of the last things I did with Evelyn while we did this book, 
was drive around Corrales. And she had that gift. We all have, you guys all have grandparents, you all have elders, and we all probably miss a lot of them. And they had this way of seeing a place, like seeing layers of places that aren't there anymore. And this picture is the Blackberry field that used to exist. It's now where, um, oh my gosh, is it Quilts Olay? Maybe that's something new now. Anyway, you guys know where I'm talking about. This was a Blackberry patch and Evelyn wrote the little caption where Evelyn and Johnny, the week they met in this Blackberry patch. And across from that is the um, Corrales Montessori School, Cottonwood Montessori School, where my boy went to school. But it's, there's a big parking lot right there. But for Evelyn, when she drives by that, she, she would see um, the potato patch that her mother-in-law um, planted because she had all these kids to raise. And so one day Evelyn and I drove and so while I see this potato patch and I see the little Montessori school where my kids in school, Evelyn saw this potato patch. And this is when I really got it, what it means to um, belong to a place and to have a place you call home. And so this is just short little reading that I'm gonna share with you. Evelyn and I had a 10th of a field planted by the time I have to pick up my boy from school. Inside, Mr. Frank's class is practicing on the steel drums. A calypso version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow drifts out into the parking lot and to Mrs. Losack's impossible potato field across the way and into that long ago blackberry patch where Johnny met Evelyn. If things should change, and they will, our son will always still know this piece of land as his first schoolroom. He'll know this little village as the place where he learned to climb trees in old cottonwoods along riverbanks and ride a horse without a saddle. He'll know what summer is supposed to feel like, that the smell of fresh apples and roasting chili means autumn, that Halloween is bumping along ditch banks on a hay wagon attached to your dad's pickup with nothing but moonlight and your friend's laughter, La Llorona floating by. He will never find another place in the world that has pasole, quite like TC's down at the Tijuana. He'll mark the passage of time by the changing colors in the bosque from amethyst to green to yellow to auburn. Here is where his story will start and here will be his home. There's an old Spanish phrase for the feeling you have about a place, la carencia. It's about having a connection to a place that cannot be severed. It's the way you feel about a place that is your homeland, the place you love, the place your soul craves. It may not be the place where you were born, but it is the place where you belong. One last thing with Evelyn, and then I wanna show you a two minute video and then we'll be done, we'll be done. Evelyn, as you know, had all these letters to the editor in the Corrales comment, and she always signed it para Corrales, which in Spanish means for Corrales. And when Evelyn was dying a few years ago, in um, January of 19, or 2016, she had the most exquisite death. Her family brought her home and she had a bed there in her living room and she could look out on her field and beyond that, on her apple orchard, and beyond that, the river, and beyond that, the Sandia Mountains. And people came and they said goodbye, and they talked to her, and they laughed, and they told stories, and they sang together. And um, I asked her, I said, is there, do you wanna have a last letter? to the Carl's Comet. <laughs> and you can even talk about water. You can talk about how much you hate coyotes, but do you wanna have a last letter? And she did. And she dictated to me and I wanted to share it to you, share it with you. It's really short, but dear editor in Coraleños. Sorry, um, the hour is near. We have gathered each of us in our different ways and we did what we could 
and what we can for Corrales. All of the good things that have happened in Corrales have been done by community efforts. Thanks for those of you who have respected and cared for and supported our farms. And no thanks to you who have treated Corrales with reckless abandon to the Walmart specialists. <laughs> she hated Walmart, by the way, because it took away from the, the local growers and suppliers. Okay. Thanks for all the organizations that have built up a sense of achievement and community. Thanks for all the students and fellow gardeners and farmers. And now for the agenda. Get rid of the elms so that we don't lose the valley. Protect the domestic animal life, not the destroyers. It's late, but maybe Intel will leave us with a few drops of water in the aquifer. What remains of Corrales will remain by the grace of God and the weather and our attention and our care, but mostly our care. Love one another and stay connected with one another. I feel like I could go on forever but I'm afraid the body is going ploop. <laughs> so many of you, one and all, thank you. Para Corrales, Evelyn Curtis Losak. And I'm gonna share this little um, two minute super eight film I shot so that you can hear Evelyn singing because she was a beautiful singer. Later in life, she started to lose uh, her voice, but it was still gorgeous. She could still belt it out. Let me see if I can uh, call this little up. It's like a two minute thing. And then I'll, let's see here. Full screen. Can you guys still all see this? Is this all good? We can see it. Okay, I'm gonna hit play and it's a couple minutes long. When you have your volume up, you can hear Miss Avon. And thank you. This is where but most people back out. Look at the, the, the range of it. That's why 
don't hear most people sing it anymore. was beautiful oh my gosh i'm sorry sandra we went past the no, time it's unanimous everybody was saying in chat that they would like you to continue everybody's enjoying your talk stacia that was such a gift that you gave us all and now we're going to open it up to questions and answers if you'd like to turn on your cameras or your microphones you have the option to do that and please feel free to ask stacia a question there was one from elena um in the chat i don't know if you'd like to ask it elena Oh, yeah. about the sheep. Um, so I know we're going back to the sheep, but did they ever make cheese too? I mean, you said they used the hide and they, um, they of course made mutton, but, and of course the wool, but did they use it for, for cheese as well or no? It's a very funny story because at one of the Sheepest Life festivals, um, there were some Corsicans from Corsica in France who came over who um, traditionally would make cheese with their um, sheep. And they had this whole cultural exchange. They actually invited the Navajos over to Corsica and I went with the Begay family because the Corsicans wouldn't use the, um, the fleece but they would use the cheese. Whereas, you know, just the opposite. And it was this wonderful cultural exchange. So um, at least with the Begay family, they were, not, they were not making cheese. I can't speak for other um, Navajo families, but um, it was mostly for the fleece. Could you tell us how to spell the name of the sheep? Yes, it's um, churro, and it's um, just like the thing you get at the state fair, the New Mexico State Fair, C-H-U-R-R-O. And actually, um, a lot of the Hispanic families in northern New Mexico um, use the churro as well, and it's, it's enjoying a resurgence now. Um, I look just particularly for the Navajo connection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Those were two beautiful love stories. I'm sorry? Those were two beautiful love stories. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for joining. They just, um, I, man, I've been blessed to, to have friendships with them and we've become extended family. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad to share their stories with you. Thank you, Stacia. I, I really enjoyed all of it. It was it was it was just wonderful. Oh, Lois, <laughs> thanks for joining. Yes, good to see you. I have a question about that Begay name because aren't a lot of the most famous weavers Begays? You know, if if I have this right, I think Begay is one of those names that almost means like the son of. So it's a very common name. And um, the Begay family that I photographed, there are weavers in the family, but just like, you know, the shoemaker's daughter, you know, they have no sh shoes. The same with their family, they, they give away or sell all of their weaving. So, um, yeah, so it's a pretty common name, but this, this particular family lives out in um, Window Rock area, Jedito. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a common name. I just want to thank you for talking about family. Um, been sitting here <laughs> um, reliving the, the day that Evelyn died and thinking about how uh, Corrales has become my second home and how important it is for us all to find home wherever we are. And the fact that we now have people that we love in the Corrales Cemetery brings that whole sort of circle of life to the experience I have here over 30 years. So thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle, for being a part of our community and making it. <laughs> this is Mary and um, Stacia, your gifts just keep on giving and I am so impressed. And I just want to library for recognizing your gifts and 
showcasing what you've done and who you are and just a, a, what a gift. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. <laughs> All honors go to the people I've been photographing as, as you understand with your yes, picture. I do, but it's, it's you too. So <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. So, is someone asking a question? Michael's playing the talk, but I think she's muted. I think she's muted. Michael, she's she's not muted. It's just very low. She's having some kind of a reception issue. I think that's where we're getting that squealing noise. Normally, we'd hear her um her owls in the background. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I, I I can't hear anything. She was thanking Stacia. Uh, <laughs> I, I got part of it, but not all of it. But thank you, Michael, for being here also. Great. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask Stacia tonight? Hey, Stacia, your, your photography was just enchanting. Truly enchanting. Yes, you truly Stacia, captured the magic that you spoke of, of Evelyn's farm and uh, the Big A family. Each picture that came by uh, just told so much in those photos, they were beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing them with us tonight. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It just comes through, this, this spirit tends to just come through when it's there, you know, you're just a medium at that point. <laughs> so Stacia, I have a question about your um, modus operandi with when photographing. Are you taking a lot of photographs and then editing, you know, finding the ones that really you like or do you wait? Um, are you like parsimonious or are you just taking a lot of pictures? Um, most of the time I'm not taking pictures. I, I'm a photojournalist, so I, I don't set things up. I don't arrange or change anything. I just try to sort of blend in the background. But most of the time during these pictures, I was, you know, um, helping make pickles or, um, you know, herd sheep or cut potatoes or, um, which, you know, that's 90% of it. And, and the last 10% are the pictures you make. And then there's the bulk of pictures you don't make because it doesn't feel right. And um, and what I love is when you look back at stuff and we, we all have this, we all have our, our gifts and our talents and our creativity, the, the stuff that you didn't do anything with that you poke back, you know, when you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's what it meant because it, it comes from your heart. It doesn't have to come from here. It comes from down here. And you may not see it right away, but then it, it manifests. And so that's what this work is, is, is a lot of, a lot of those moments that, you know, there's magic out in that world. Let me tell you. <laughs> so are you planning another book, Stacia? Oh, good God. I've got so <laughs> many book projects, Sandra. I'm doing one right now. I have all the, this beautiful cachet of letters between my mom and dad during World War II. They were 19 and in love. And my dad was on a minesweeper in the Atlantic, you know, um, sweeping mines before the invasion of Normandy and all these letters. I'm like, oh my golly, there's something there. And I'm also trying to write a novel, which is, it's, that's a little tricky, but um, yeah, these things come to you, right? In the middle of the Sprouts grocery store, it's like, boom, there it is, inspiration. Oh, I can't wait till they're completed and I can't wait to, uh, to Me see either. them. Me yeah. either, my family. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you again, Stacia, for this beautiful gift. Did you have a question, Rudy? Yeah, I don't, You, I guess you can hear me, you're answering. Uh, let's see, a couple of questions, Stacia. Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, what would be, when you get to heaven and you run into Evelyn Losak, what will be the one thing you will ask her <laughs> when you tell her? <laughs> How do you get rid of those squash bugs? <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Oh my gosh. You know what? On her on her tombstone, 
Um, she's like an all sing on. And, and to me, that's the question is like, how do we sing on? How do we sing on, on these times that are, you know, pushing us and challenging us? And this is what our, our elders have for us, that wisdom of how do we get through this? How do we keep what? singing? Oh, and I'll <laughs> and I'll sing on. Yes. I'll call you on. 